everyone, welcome. And thank you for joining us today for the JCF Charitable Planning Update webinar. My name is Tamara Snyder and I'm the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications here at Jewish Communal Funds. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this webinar. Lee M. Cohen, CPA, is a managing partner and founder of LM Cohen & Co. He is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the New York State Society of Certified Public Accountants. He holds a bachelor's in accounting from New York University. Lee is actively involved in his community by serving as a trustee and past president of Spartak Beaker Holem, and he is a trustee of Jewish Communal Fund. He holds a bachelor's in accounting from NYU. We also have with us Ellen Israelson, the vice president of philanthropic services and CMO at JCF. Most of you are familiar with JCF. We're the largest Jewish donor advised fund in the country, currently managing $2 billion in charitable assets for over 4,100 funds. Ellen oversees JCF's marketing group and client relations. Are you not, is someone, no one's hearing me? I hear you. You hear me? Okay, somebody said they weren't able to hear. Hopefully <laughs> they're able to fix that on their end. Um, Ellen oversees JCF's marketing group and client relations team and heads philanthropic services for JCF's clients. Additionally, she spearheads JCF's private client group and the family office roundtable, as well as JCF's advisors network. She is an expert in multi-generational philanthropy and helps high net worth individuals and their families be more intentional in their approach to philanthropy and increase the impact of their giving. Now, just a bit of housekeeping. We're gonna have, we have a Q&A um, tab on your, on your screen. So if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please type them in there and then we'll definitely get to them at the end of the, um, towards the end of the webinar. Um, you could also chat to me if you're having any technical problems or anything I could help you with throughout this webinar. Okay, so it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Ellen, who will give us a charitable giving overview. Thank you, Tamar. It's so nice that so many new people have joined us today. And of course, a big shout out to our JCF Advisor Network. Uh, we certainly miss being able to get together with all of you at our seminars and networking events. And I hope before long, maybe even by spring, we'll be able to get together in person again. But today we have a great opportunity to do our annual presentation on uh, charitable planning. And my thanks to Lee Cohn, who's uh, helping us out today. Lee's a, a very valued member of JCF's Board of Trustees. But before we dive into the discussion on tax issues and, and planning strategies, I wanted to look a little more broadly at the charitable giving picture and provide an, an overview. Um, every year, Indiana University, the Lilly School of Philanthropy, uh, does a deep dive on charitable giving in the U.S., a very comprehensive report. And the last one was issued in 2019. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see that in 2019, total giving uh, reached a remarkable level, almost $450 billion. Uh, so it really speaks to the generosity uh, of Americans, and it remains quite strong. Over the last three decades, we have seen a fairly steady increase uh, despite what's going on in the market or the economy, there are some bumps, but overall in the last three decades, we have seen very significant increase, which really shows what a deeply held value philanthropy is in our culture. But let's take a look now at who's giving, where, where are these billions of dollars coming from? So, you see here, overwhelmingly, almost 70% of this money comes from individuals. 17% uh, from foundations, and that includes your large community foundations, your big operating foundations, like your Gates Foundation or Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, a mere 5% comes from corporations. Uh, it, Corporate giving has never really driven philanthropy, even in its heyday. And 10% has come from bequests, 
So the story is really about individual giving, because if you look at the bequests are just individual gifts, they happen uh, after individuals are deceased, the others are individuals giving in lifetime, you're looking at almost 80% of that 450 billion, it's really coming from individuals. So let's take a closer look at who's giving and how they're giving. You see here on this next slide that 70% uh, of all households reported that they contribute to charity. And that is really across the economic spectrum. It's all economic strata. So that shows how deeply ingrained charitable giving is. 91% of high net worth households report that they give on a regular basis to charities. So this is a very important statistic now when there's such great need to know how deeply motivated people are to give charitably. That has remained constant uh, over the decades. It has increased slightly, but that has always been strong. What is starting to change though, is not how many people give, but how they give. And just in the past three years, there's been a real switch from giving by writing checks, we call it checkbook charities, to using vehicles. And the preferred vehicle is becoming the donor advised fund which grew by 60% in the past year. And I think the real story though, is about the giving grants from donor advised funds grew 20% to $19 billion. And DAFs on average give out anywhere between 20 to 22% of all of the assets that they're managing. So that giving has really been quite strong. And in this, of course, is 2019. In 2020, DAFs are already reporting a very big uptick in grant making and the assets going out to charity, of course, because of the, the COVID crisis. So let's take a look at that giving. Here, you see the remarkable response to the COVID crisis. It just dwarfs all of the previous giving to disasters, all of the various hurricanes and fires. And this, this number is about two or three months old. So it, already we have surpassed 12 billion that's gone to, to COVID relief. And uh, we're very proud and, and honored at JCF to be a part of getting that money out to the charitable sector. We've seen a real uptick in giving from our, our fund holders, and we've worked very hard to get the money out quickly to all charities. And in addition, we've been able to support COVID relief through our special gifts fund, which is our endowment, through generous gifts that we have made to UJA Federation, Met Council, and Self-Help to address some of the terrible food insecurity, housing needs, uh, the need for PPE. Uh, and we're so pleased that we can play a significant part in that. And now that we've gotten a feeling for what's going on broadly in charity and charitable giving, let's take a look at the planning. Today, we're gonna discuss two basic areas that go into the planning, the tax considerations, and of course, personal goals and what you're trying to accomplish, because you really need to look at both sides to do the optimal planning. And now I'd like to turn it over to Lee Cohn, who will update us and walk us through some of the tax issues and some of the vehicles. Lee? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Tamar, for putting this uh, all together. And thank you for all the participants that are joining us today. Um, as you know uh, and heard over the past uh, seven, eight months uh, during this current pandemic, our government has enacted the CARES and SECURE Acts. Um, these acts were uh, aimed at helping during this tough time, uh, businesses, individuals, um, and there were a few different um, considerations regarding charity in these acts. Uh, 
Um, the current law before these were enacted allowed a donor to give 60% of his adjusted gross income to charity. Um, and the CARES Act uh, changed that and then it allowed you to um, give 100% of your income to charity. But the nuance to that is although you can give 100%, you cannot give uh, that 100% to a donor advised fund such as JCF or to a private foundation. It has to be direct to uh, a not-for-profit institution. Uh, so although they are uh, helping, uh, I think the idea was to help the institutions directly um, more than uh, allowing people to get the charitable deduction. Um, the second um, um, change with respect to charity um, is they allowed for everyone, even if you don't itemize your deductions, a $300 charitable deduction. Um, I know this is very small, but it was just worth noting. Um, and the last thing uh, with respect to charity is uh, you're allowed to, you're allowed to currently uh, donate um, up to $100,000 from your IRA to uh, a charity in lieu of taking that required minimum distribution. They've lifted that $100,000 limit. But once again, uh, it has to be direct to a charity and not to a donor advised fund or a private foundation. Um, that is, those are the changes in these acts with respect to charity. Um, so, you know, the next uh, topic I'd like to talk about is, you know, what types of charitable vehicles, when, what do we do, when do we do it, how do we choose uh, the different areas that we're going into? Um, and you'll see on the slide, there's different questions that we, uh, that need to be considered. Uh, you know, the financial need of a donor and the heirs, do they want income? Uh, do they want an income tax benefit? Do they want to see income? And there's different vehicles for each of these things that we're talking about, and we'll get to them on the next pages. Um, you know, the time horizon, do they want to make the gift now? Do they want the charity to benefit now or after their lifetime? Is it an estate planning mechanism? Um, how much control of uh, the donations and grant making uh, do they want? They want to have a control of the investments. And, um, you know, the next thing is privacy versus recognition. Do they want to be under the radar? Do they want their name out there and people to know what they're doing and who they're giving to? Um, flexibility. Um, do you need flexibility in, in the timing of your grants? Um, and coupling that with your charitable contributions and your tax benefits. Um, and then, you know, do they wanna do loans to people? Is that part of what they wanna do is their charitable impact? Do they want uh, to help other businesses? So I think that with each uh, different mechanism, um, you know, a donor advised fund, a private foundation or, or direct giving uh, achieves uh, some of these different things. And, and we'll go through that now. Um, there, there are a few different types of charitable vehicles that people can use, um, obviously besides for giving directly to an institution. Um, you can set up a private foundation, um, which would be a foundation under uh, your own family name, um, and you direct, you, uh, you know, you put money in there, you take a charitable deduction, and then you uh, direct the different uh, grants that you want to make. Um, another vehicle is a charitable lead and charitable remainder trusts. Um, and those are really uh, trusts set up to have um, either the income go to a charity or the uh, amount left in the trust when uh, the person passes away go directly to a charity. Um, they're very good vehicles for estate planning purposes or 
if there's a uh, an event uh, such as a sale of a business or significantly appreciated securities, those are utilized. Um, and then there's donor advised funds. Um, and donor advised fund is JCF, obviously. Um, you, you make a donation to the fund, uh, they invest it for you and you make recommendations on how and where to uh, give grants um, and it's to other 501c3 organizations as well. Um, just back to the charitable lead and remainder trust, um, th there's many times that the remainder uh, or the income of those trusts, uh, the beneficiary is your own donor advised fund. So you're able to have a little bit more control of it and control of where the money goes, uh, whether it be you or your family members. So I wanted to discuss some of the differences between a, don a donor advised fund and a private foundation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the limitation on a cash contribution, um, whether it be to a donor advised fund uh, or to a charity is 60% of the donor's adjusted gross income. Um, when you make a contribution to a, pri a private foundation, it's limited to 30% of your adjusted gross income. Uh, that, that's for cash contributions. When you are giving appreciated securities, uh, a stock or um, an interest in a partnership or something that's been appreciated, you have a 30% limit of the AGI for a donor advised fund and a 20% limit for a, fi for a private foundation. Um, these, as I mentioned earlier, these limits didn't change under any of the new regulations under the new acts that were uh, implemented. Um, in all cases, if a donor exceeds these limitations, the excess can be carried forward to, uh, for five years. So there's uh, some differences between a donor advised fund and a private foundation, and we try to summarize them here so people, uh, so everyone here could uh, get a little bit of an understanding. Um, so a private foundation requires a certain amount of uh, charitable giving each year, while a donor advised fund does not. Um, the administration of a, of a private foundation is, you know, you have to set up an entity, you have to file tax returns each year for the foundation. It's, um, and you have to keep track of everything and be responsible for getting receipts uh, for all your charitable giving. Uh, when, you're, um, when you have a donor advised fund, you don't need to have this. Your charity is only to the fund and it's all streamlined in one place with one receipt. Um, one advantage of a, of a um, private foundation is that you can give grant awards to individuals. It obviously would have to be based on criteria, um, but that's not something that someone can do with a donor advised fund. Um, if you have a, a special program or something that you want to uh, enact, um, under both vehicles, uh, you're able to do this um, currently. Um, the cost to establish and maintain on the fund is minimal as compared to what um, uh, compared to what you need to do with a private foundation. And I, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier with respect to preparing tax returns. Um, and, and keeping track of what's going on in the set of books. Uh, when uh, you have a fund, uh, it's all maintained by, um, by the fund itself. Um, and the biggest thing, and I know this is very important for many people, is the privacy. Uh, when you have a private foundation, you need to publish, uh, you need to make it available and people can see what you've donated to the, fund, uh, to the foundation and who you're giving to. Uh, with a donor advised fund, this is not the case. Everything can be done discreetly and privately. I'm gonna turn it back over to Ellen. 
Uh, okay. Thank you, Lee. And thanks for that great description of the different vehicles. You know, it's important to be aware of all the different options so you can figure out what really fits all of your needs. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about the donor advised fund and, and who benefits or how you can benefit from a donor advised fund. Um, Oh, we seem to be having technical difficulties. So let's see. Am I on camera now? You are. Good. Okay. All right. Wow, I even did makeup. I want I want to be on camera. I went to all that trouble. So one of the great advantages of the donor advice fund over all the other vehicles is the fact that you don't have any of the administrative work. So for people who don't want to track every donation and follow when did I give to this charity? How often did I give? Do I have all of the receipts? All of that is eliminated by having the donor advised fund. So if you're the kind of person that really doesn't want to do all the administrative work, this is a big advantage. Um, so also some people don't love going online for other people, their whole life's online. The banking is online, I buy things online. So if you really want an efficient digital tool, donor advised funds offer that. Um, also, it's just something that works very well depending on income situations. If you have an unusual wealth event, an inheritance, a sale of a business, uh, you really need to plan out your giving. That is often a trigger for when you have to go from checkbook charity or giving with your credit card to thinking through what you want to do with your philanthropy, what are the tax ramifications, and how are you best going to move forward. Um, in addition, um, we can switch slides, go to the next one. Uh, there's no setup costs and that's a great advantage. It doesn't require, uh, I'm sorry to the attorneys on the call, but it doesn't require an attorney. It doesn't <laughs> require a lot of drafting of documents. In a couple of days, you have this very efficient vehicle and there's no cost to you. The other interesting thing about a donor advised fund is it works together with other vehicles. So people who want to terminate a private foundation can actually transfer assets from a private foundation into the donor advised fund. They can continue to support the charities they supported through the foundation, but now they no longer have the 990 PF and all of the reporting requirements. Um, Lee mentioned this before, a big thing that people think about when they're figuring out the best way to do their giving is how much privacy do they want? Are they okay with their name being out there? Are they okay with people being able to do research on the 990s of charities and seeing all the donors? Or are they looking for a greater level of privacy? Uh, and, and the last thing, but I think this is tremendously important to a lot of our people at Jewish Communal Fund is, do you want to involve your children and grandchildren? Are you looking for a way to engage younger family members and continue the legacy of giving? And because the threshold to open a donor advised fund is very low, most open at 5,000. At Jewish Communal Fund for minors and people under 30, you can open a fund for $1,800. It's a great stepping stone and a way to put younger family members on their own road to philanthropy and to get them started. So those are some of the reasons that people look to donor advised funds and some of the benefits. Now let's talk about some, some tips overall for your planning. Uh, I always like to start with the discussion of personal goals before you jump into the technical side of things. And it's very helpful to use open-ended questions to help you think through what you want to accomplish. Uh, and this is really a very worthwhile step in the planning process. 
some of the questions you can ask yourself is, what does success mean to me? Or asking a client, how do you view success? What does that look like beyond just the money? What are you trying to accomplish with your wealth? What values are particularly important to you? And how are we going to align the planning with your values? And of course, if you're looking at giving not just lifetime, but uh, in the estate planning, what kind of legacy would you like to leave? And I think all of these questions bring up a lot of the why, the motivation, and what people want to accomplish beyond simply getting the tax deduction. Uh, the next tip we have are about almost a checklist of things that should come into the discussion. Income, obviously, if there's a bonus, an inheritance, a raise, any kind of unusual wealth event that's changing the annual income picture, that's going to impact, uh, that's going to have tax ramifications as well as potential opportunities for charitable giving. Um, sale of a property, uh, appreciated securities, anything where you're having to realize capital gains, that's another opportunity for charitable giving where you really want to work on a plan. And then, of course, as we mentioned, legacy, the estate planning, where you're looking to transmit not just the wealth, but to transmit values and make a statement about your beliefs and what was important. So all of these things are going to inform the charitable planning conversation. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Lee, who will talk more about the actual strategies. Sure. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so as you know, I'm an accountant and we, we meet and discuss with our clients all the time about charitable giving. And there's a couple of tips that, you know, we discuss every year uh, with a lot of our clients. Um, you know, in, in a year when there's an event, a wealth event, or a good year in business, um, or potentially changes in tax laws, um, you know, I'd like to advise the clients to make a significant contribution, um, you know, before the end of the year, even if it means that it's going to be uh, the amount that they would like to give to charity over the next couple of years, uh, there's many times that we'll bunch it all into one year to get the tax advantage, um, especially if we're not sure of what their income would look like in future years. Um, if you could go to the next, yes, thank you. Um, you know, we like to look at what is the most adva advantageous asset to give to charity? Is it your cash? Is it property that you own and potentially going to sell? Is it private stock of your business? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, trust vehicles, you know, as a remainder person from one of the trusts, um, you know, uh, keeping your private foundation or closing it down and donating it to the fund, bonds, mutual funds. It's really looking at your whole portfolio and making the right decision from a tax perspective um, and your own personal and investment perspectives of you know, what is the best asset to donate uh, to charity or your fund. So I wanna speak about uh, donating appreciated long-term securities because I think that this is the best advantage um, and the best way for people to recognize significant tax savings. If you have a stock, and we'll use a stock as an example that is appreciated, um, you can donate that uh, stock to uh, your donor advised fund. Uh, you won't pay capital gains tax on the appreciation and you'll get a charitable deduction for making that contribution. So it's a win-win. Now, there's many instances where I have clients that tell me, Lee, I have this stock, but I don't want to get rid of it. I, I still want to give charity. I still want to make my donation to the fund, but all everything in my portfolio, I don't want to get rid of. 
So what I tell them to do in that case is I have them take cash, put it in their portfolio, buy the stock that they're going to donate, um, and then donate the stock. And what they did at that point is they've increased their basis in their portfolio and they maximized the charitable deduction. Um, and it's a win-win and it's been very helpful and useful to a lot of my clients um, with uh, respect to uh, you know, eliminating some of those unrealized gains in their portfolio. Um, if anyone has any questions regarding that strategy, uh, uh, we'll have Tamar share my email address um, and you can reach out to me to talk about it further, but I, I'm very in favor of this strategy and I think it's helpful and great for um, many people. Uh, so I've been on the board of JCF for a couple of years now. Um, I work with, you know, I have my own fund with the JCF um, and I am a big, big advocate to everyone that I speak to about utilizing a, a donor advised fund. And obviously as a board member, uh, my preferred choice is the JCF. Um, JCF has 50 years of experience. Um, everything is done so easily and streamlined on their website. Um, there's, a extreme, there's a robust uh, amount of investment options uh, available. Um, they work very closely with you if you have family uh, goals and multi-generational uh, uh, things that you want to uh, achieve. Um, and like I said earlier, um, uh, you know, the privacy is something that is just great and, you know, you don't have to have the whole world knowing what you're doing. Um, the people at JCF have been great at um, answering questions and working closely with clients. Um, even most recently, I had a client who had, is having an event um, you know, a sale of a business interest, and we were able to partner up with JCF to uh, help mitigate some of the tax liabilities there. Um, I think now we'll turn it back to Tamar for uh, questions. Thank you so much, Lee. And I, I love that stock uh, strategy. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we Feel, please feel free at this point, if you haven't already, you could type in some questions into the Q&A and we're happy to, to answer them. Or you could put in the chat if that's easier, we'll look at both places. In the meantime, we got one question that came in. Is there a way that families could use donor advised funds to get younger people involved in giving? Uh, okay, I'll take a stab at that. Um, we have several ways that younger people get involved with charitable giving. For, for minors, uh, for young children, we do have a, a fund that's like a custodial fund the child would be on with the parent. It's often open to actually at bar bat mitzvah as a way of starting to engage the young adult with uh, some of their own giving, although this, as I said, is done in conjunction with a parent or a grandparent. It's also a lovely way for a grandparent and a grandchild to work together to discuss charities and why giving is important and talk about tzedakah. Uh, for young adults um, who may not have a lot of their own money yet, we do have those lower balance funds, they're $1,800. We also have people who just add adult children onto their existing funds as authorized parties. So they, you could have your own fund and you could simply add an adult child as authorized to make grants in their own name. So these are all different ways that we start to get people engaged in charitable giving as families. Okay, great. And um, Lee, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that about donor advised funds when working with multi-generational families. Uh, 
you know, I, I think in conjunction with uh, estate planning, um, I, I think it's a, a valuable tool. Great, wonderful. Okay, another question. We got a few questions that are coming in. Keep keep them coming. Um, <laughs> so we have one. How is grant making handled from a donor advised fund rather than writing checks out directly? Do I get a checkbook? It sounds like they want have a question about the process, how it works. Okay, so everything is handled through Jewish communal fund. You never write a check. You never have to record anything. For most people, just log on, they type in the name of the charity they want to support, they put in any specific information, if it's for a particular fund or a particular scholarship or research, uh, how they want to be acknowledged to the charity. And then the grants are sent out directly from Jewish Communal Fund. So, and you will see when uh, the grants or checks are sent out. And the charity knows it's from you because in addition to having your fund name right on the check, on the JCF check, there's a cover letter that goes out where we transmit the information if you want to release it about who's giving, your address where you can be acknowledged, and any special instructions or purpose for the grant. And that is all done directly by JCF. That's great. And Ellen, we have another question that, that came in wanting to know about transferring funds, I believe, into their fund at JCF. Um, they wanted to know if JCF is looking into implementing online transfers instead of mailing in checks or setting up bank wires. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about the other ways um, that, that people could send us. Um, I don't know if they're talking about securities here. Okay, well, I'll just run through it briefly. I mean, Typically, if people are transferring cash, it is going to be a, a wire transfer. You can set up a bill pay and, and send an electronic bill pay to JCF. And securities, of course, are always done through DTC. They're always electronically transferred through the, through the brokerage uh, to our account at RBC. So, uh, and we do take credit cards. Um, People have to feel that paying the fee is worthwhile to them because the credit card company does take their fee off the top before JCF ever sees the money. But those are all electronic ways that people can give to JCF. Great. Okay. And then we, we have a question to, directed to Lee, um, where one of the participants wants to know if you could walk through um, what you said about appreciated stock and adding cash if you don't want to actually donate that stock. I, sure. so sure. I, I just want you to run, by, run it again. Just so sure. I, I think I'll use an example. Um, <laughs> and I think that'll be the best way. Um, so let's say um, somebody wants to give $100,000 into their donor advice fund and they have that cash available to give. Um, and they have their portfolio and they have $10,000 of cost basis Amazon stock that's now worth $100,000. Um, they would take the $100,000 cash, put it in their stock portfolio, buy $100,000 worth of Amazon stock on that date, and then contribute the older Amazon stock that has, that's been appreciated uh, to their donor advice fund. So what happens? What's the end result? They still own the $100,000 of stock, uh, of Amazon stock, now at the current market price, which is $100,000. And they've donated $100,000 to their donor advised fund and got the charitable deduction and didn't pay the gain, the $90,000 gain on that stock. I hope that um, makes it clearer for everybody. You're on mute, Tamar. Sorry about that. Okay, so thank you so much. That was that was so helpful. Um, and we have uh, my colleague Igor Musayev is on this call, and I'm going to ask you, Igor, if you could just talk briefly about the investment options through JCF because we got a, a question about that.
Let me see. Oh, I don't know if I could un. Let me see if I could unmute you. Give me one second. I think I have to do it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, hi. You hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We Sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Lee and Ellen. Uh, it was a very uh, nice presentation. So. Uh, we do have uh, an investments platform. So when donors donate the, their contribution, either stock or cash, uh, for example, for stock, we do liquidate right away, but there is an opportunity to reinvest using our platform, which includes various mutual funds. We have some Israeli options as well, uh, uh, Israel ETF and Israel bonds. So that's an option. Um, so that, that gives you an opportunity to kind of reinvest reinvest the money back into the market for charitable purposes only. And all the gains and income is all tax-free because it's done through JCF. So that's another great benefit. All right, thank you. And I would just add to that, for people who are looking to use a donor advised fund in lieu of a private foundation where you would uh, have you know, a wide variety of investment options, for people who are going to maintain a million dollars and above at JCF, we will uh, vet a manager not currently on the platform. So you could suggest the type of investments you might have had in the foundation and our external investment advisors will vet that and make a recommendation to the uh, boards, uh, to the investment committee of the board to see if we can accommodate you. So we do try to, in the private client group, tailor the investments uh, around the preferences of the fund holder. Great. Yeah, Ellen, I think that that's all the questions. I for thought today. I saw one other question want... about um, contributions from an LLC, and I wanted to talk about oh, that. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the question okay. was, can a contributed LLC be purchased back from JCF? So in, it would be very difficult to purchase it back if you were the person who received the tax deduction initially. Um, so you're talking about, you know, it, it, we need more details. If Is this person... Uh, contributing the shares to us and then buying the shares back. Uh, you know, we, we really have to talk through the details, but to speak more broadly, we can take an interest in an LLC or any privately held entity. I mean, very typically in the past, we have taken shares. We have many people who hold a variety of types of real estate properties and LLCs. Some of the underlying properties are being sold. JCF at, at a good arm's length from the sale can take an interest in the LLC and then we would be a party to the sale. I think one of the things you have to be very careful about though um, on uh, gifting an interest in an LLC is if you're close to a sale, you want to make sure that you still meet the legal requirement to be arm's length from that sale. Because if you've already made an even an oral commitment, and certainly if you've signed any documents already, you're too close. You're past the window where you could gift those shares. But we can certainly take interest in LLCs, both onshore and offshore. And, and we work closely with outside counsel on being able to execute this, but each, it's very case by case. So we really have to talk offline. And if anyone has questions, actually, if they want to contact me, it's Ellen, E-L-L-E-N at jcfny.org. Um, I think we're coming pretty close to our time. Was there any other question or have we pretty much addressed whatever's come in? Yeah, I think we got everything that came in. Okay, fantastic. If questions come to mind, please reach out to us. Um, it's a little easier to reach us uh, by email at the moment because people are not regularly in the office, but we will set up a time for a call. Uh, I want to thank Lee Cohn for his 
wisdom for taking the time to do this fabulous presentation for us. And a thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, we are really in the giving season now. Uh, we, we've just had our Giving Tuesday. I know people are anxious to make their year-end gifts. So if JCF can help you streamline that, please be in touch. We're happy to help you. Thank you all. Bye.